Blog Talk Radio. Hello, this is Call Talk for Wednesday, January 20th. Our topic today is After Call Work Time, How to Minimize and Still Have Great Customer Record. During the call, we invite you to ask questions via email at calltalk at benchmarkportal.com or call in to the host and ask your questions and interact with the show. The number to call in is 347-857-3117. Everyone who asks a question via email or phone on the show will receive a free copy of Bruce's book, Benchmarking at Its Best, and one person will be chosen at random to win an in-depth reality check report value of $1,500. And now I'd like to introduce the host of Call Talk, Bruce Belfiore. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Sean, and welcome everybody back to Call Talk. Our listeners chose today's topic on after-call work time. Okay, it's not the most blood-stirring of metrics, not one that we sit down and uh, chat about every day, but, but it is an integral part of handle time and one which does deserve a microscope on it for, for once. I mean, even after-call work time deserves a little TLC. So today, after-call work time will get its 15 minutes of fame on call talk. Uh, actually, we give it 30 minutes of fame. Uh, in fact, we have a, a, a information-filled half hour ahead, which will include the results of the one-minute survey that many of you have participated in. And to help us sort through the, the somewhat arcane components of uh, after-call work time, we have as our guest today John Chatterley. Now, John has uh, worked in our industry for over 20 years, uh, many of those as a hands-on call center employee and manager at uh, pretty much every level from agent to call center director with a Fortune 500 company. So a lot of experience here. And he was responsible for actually building and launching two uh, centers. So John's known to many of you as the author of numerous research papers and uh, content editor for, of others. And uh, his books include Offshore or Outsourcing Opportunities that he wrote with Dr. John Anton. So John, welcome to the program. Thank you, Bruce. I'm happy to be with you. Okay, great. Well, John, let me start off by telling my, my favorite story about after-call work time. I went into one center where we had gotten their benchmarking report ahead of time, and it had indicated that they had zero seconds after-call work time. And I thought, well, this is great. These are people who are able to do everything during the course of the call. And then I started doing some side-by-sides, which is the best way to find out what's really going on in a center. And I started hearing the agent saying, uh, hello, this is so-and-so. Uh, thank you for calling XYZ Company. Could you hold for a minute while I finish up the record on the previous call? <laughs> so the, uh, what they actually I'm, I'm afraid was, that's all too typical. <laughs> that's right. No, it's not, not the last time, unfortunately, I've heard it. So they sort of legislated uh, after-call work time out of existence, but it really wasn't. It was simply included in the talk time of the uh, following call. So, in any event, was part of uh, handle time, I guess. That's where it uh, comes in. But, John, over to you. If you could give us some of uh, your opening comments on it, and then we can take a look also at the research that we've just done. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, well, uh, after call work time, wrap time, post call processing, these are just some of the names that that important little bit of time once a call has ended with an agent uh, is, is called. And... Uh, that while many call centers or, or many call center managers um, recognize this as part of a daily uh, part of their operation, uh, most call center managers that I know also regard it as a, as a constant challenge because uh, it always seems that if attention isn't paid to it, uh, after call work time tends to creep up and uh, then uh, – that uh, that impacts the uh, uh, the volume of calls they can field. Uh, it starts to impact uh, queue time and uh, and uh, call uh, call handling efficiency. So mm -hmm. it does need to be paid attention to. And uh, the recent survey that we conducted, I think, uh, uh, highlighted that fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's a, a very important little component of time there. And of course, we we have seen some centers that have quite long after call work time and we've seen situations in which the agent needs to uh, uh, enter quite a bit of record in uh, sometimes from handwritten notes they've taken during the call and sometimes that's an indication that their agent desktop is not uh, really efficient 
uh, they have to resort to the handwritten notes uh, because of the fact that they would have to toggle among too many screens to uh, basically deal with the information during the call. Um, and in other cases, it's because they actually have to get up and go to a filing cabinet or do something that's paper-based. Uh, so we see that as well. Uh, back over to you, John. Well, I'm sure a lot of the people on the phone that are listening in on the call today participated in our recent one-minute uh, survey. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, why don't we take a look at a couple of the uh, preliminary results that have mm -hmm. come in. We got we we received excellent uh, participation and response on this topic, so that's an indication that many people regard it as important and something that's on their minds. Right. Uh, Quite a bit. Uh, one of the calls, uh, one of the, one of the questions that we asked them was, uh, uh, do some or all of the calls that their call center handles necessitate uh, after-call documentation? The response was uh, overwhelming. Over 92 percent of those that responded indicated that uh, some of their calls require after-call documentation. Mm -hmm. So well, this the, is something uh, that really does touch everybody. I mean, it may be a bit arcane and, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, seemingly a smaller topic compared to some of the others. But, in fact, it's one that does touch, as you said, 92% of uh, those polled. And uh, I thought it was interesting, too. Those who answered no, in other words, that 8%, uh, the reason that they didn't have any after-call work time on any calls was because uh, in, in over 80% of the cases, they're able to actually complete the documentation during the call, and, and the rest it's because they have the kind of call that uh, is simple information like, you know, nearest location of stores, uh, operation hours, and that kind of thing. Right, right. Yeah, that uh, that was, uh, uh, I found that very enlightening, not that it was altogether unexpected, but uh, uh, there are tools out there these days that some call, call centers have started to use to to help them improve the uh, uh, their ability to handle uh, or to document the calls uh, mm -hmm. while they're while the uh, caller is still on the call. Okay, why, and, why don't you tell uh, us about some of those and what people uh, gave back as responses on those? Well, um, we we asked the question which tools. Um, they use, and uh, over three quarters of them indicated that uh, electronic CRM or customer relationship management uh, uh, systems uh, are being used. Uh, this, uh, these systems tend to help uh, automate the call uh, record keeping uh, and include uh, things that. Uh, such as pre-formatted text to paste into the call report, the use of short codes mm -hmm. to document caller issues or actions, mm -hmm. and uh, so forth. So those are the tools that uh, most response indicated that they use mm -hmm. in order to uh, uh, document their calls and speed up the after-call work uh, uh, part of the call handling process. Right, right. You know, John, one of the things that we do when we work with call centers is try to find out what the best process is and also what the uh, financial impact of that is. I think one of the areas in which we see the greatest uh, ROIs is with good uh, electronic CRM, pre-formatted taxes, the things that you're talking about, uh, going from wherever you are now to an optimized system, whether that is your first electronic CRM or a better electronic CRM, is oftentimes uh, one of the highest ROI things that you can do, return on investment things that you can do, not only for the call center, but for your company. <laughs> and, uh, yes, to, yes. You know, uh, do you find the same thing? I do. I, I certainly do. And, uh, and I can't emphasize uh, how much uh, a few seconds or a few minutes of improvement in call after call handling can improve the uh, bottom line yeah. because of the efficiency that it brings to the operation. Well, here I think a, a takeaway for all of our listeners is uh, if you don't know how much a second of time is worth on your handle time for your uh, call center, uh, please calculate it. Find that out, uh, or at least uh, get it approximately, and then uh, think about how you might be able to reduce your average handle time 
uh, by how many seconds if you had an optimized system where your CRM really uh, worked well, uh, where the toggling among different screens, because uh, I've seen screens up to, let's see, I think the tops I've seen is 15 screens <laughs> have to be toggled among. Um, if, if that kind of optimization uh, could be done, and in some cases you can actually get middleware that will uh, greatly improve the functionality, the usability of your CRM software uh, if it's particularly uh, laden with legacy systems and stuff. And the ROI on that um, integration can be very, very high. Uh, John? Uh, yes, uh, right, Bruce. Uh, I'd like to move to another result that uh, that I found very interesting in the study, and uh, what, and that is that uh, we asked them the question, how regularly do they track uh, their after-call work time? Mm -hmm. And uh, I was surprised to find out that uh, nearly 30% uh, either don't track uh, after-call work time or only track it... Uh, as, infre as infrequently as, as a month. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a long time to go uh, without uh, checking to see how your after-call work time uh, performance is mm -hmm. because that, that just lengthens out the amount of time uh, before you're able to implement any pro improvement initiatives, whether they be technology-based or whether they be uh, brought about through training and uh, coaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to again improve that uh, performance that eventually trickles down to the bottom line. Right. Okay. So another takeaway here is for those who aren't tracking their uh, after call work time to do so, and then to try to really think about what are the components of after call work time so that they can improve it. Uh, we probably should mention that the all industries average for our Purdue uh, Center for Customer Driven Quality database for after call work time is uh, two and a half minutes. So uh, that's obviously going to change substantially from one industry to the next, but it's it's a benchmark uh, in terms of indus the industries as a whole. Um, yeah, and uh, John, uh, there are some people who kind of uh, fix the system, <laughs> they kind of preload it. Do you want to talk about that? That was one of our questions as well in terms of uh, after call work time. Uh, sure. Uh, we a we asked them uh, what. Uh, what percent uh, actually preload the system uh, and uh, program it for a predetermined amount of uh, or a fixed uh, amount of ACW time uh, per call? Um, we learned that 33%, only 33% do this. Uh, 60, over two thirds uh, of them do not. Mm -hmm. um, not having a, a uh, a fixed uh, amount of time is one way to uh, to uh, count on uh, after call work time uh, creeping up. Um, on the other hand, um, having a fixed amount of time does have uh, a potential downside. So uh, if someone sets a fixed target for for uh, in their system for the amount of time allocated to after call work, then uh, they need to make certain that uh, a the agent has the tools, b they have uh, b they have the training, uh, and c they have the skills uh, mm. to be able to accomplish that. Uh, if if that becomes a uh, uh, a barrier, uh, then uh, their performance may actually start to to go down. As a matter of fact, in in our survey. Uh, one of the responses that we John, got. Uh, John, excuse me if yes. I interrupt, but uh, apparently we've got a technical issue. Uh, Sean, did you want to in interrupt and tell us what's uh, what's happening? <clears throat> yeah, uh, apparently there has been a, um, a mix-up in the length of the show uh, from Blog Talk. Um, it's going to uh, shut down in 30. Uh, sorry, actually, it's been extended. Uh, I was able to get in touch with them. We're all set. So I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, That's please okay. Keep going. Sean, the miracle worker, thanks very much. <laughs> okay, so we, we won't have to have after-show work time here. <laughs> we, can, we can continue on with the show. Okay, sorry for that interruption, John. Uh, please continue. Well, I just wa I was just wanted to note that uh, that uh, one of our respondents indicated that they they were using a fixed amount of time, that they actually had to lower their goal, goal 
in order to get uh, people to move toward it. Mm. But in lowering uh, their goal, which means lengthening the amount of time allocated to after-call work, uh, uh, actually improved their overall uh, call handling performance. So mm. uh, it it needs to be tracked, uh, in my opinion, uh, it, it should be tracked at the very least weekly and in, in many cases, I think it ought to be tracked daily right. in order to be able to, to quickly catch any trends or any changes and uh, head them off before they turn into a real problem. Okay. This is a perfect metric, really, where you can do some uh, experimenting and uh, to sort of make sure that you have controlled circumstances so that you can do some experimentation uh, for those who want to set a fixed amount of after-call work time. Because, as you said, the... Um, the, the the downside is there are actually two. One is that they may not have sufficient time to finish up and therefore do good records, and therefore there can be errors in the record, which is a, a, a supplemental bad side uh, to it, and and they can have uh, continuing uh, deleterious results. And then, it, or it may be actually too much time. And I've been in a couple of centers where they actually have a little bit extra time that they uh, put in there. And it's actually, uh, they expect that it will help to reduce agent burnout uh, by actually giving them a little bit of downtime between calls. And it's scheduled in there. So it's, it's kind of interesting. A um, uh, little breathing room, so to speak. Yeah, it's a little breathing room, and it's actually policy uh, to do it that way. And taking that away can sometimes be very uh, difficult because people are going to obviously grumble about it if they've gotten used to it. So uh, you have to be a little careful in going to it because uh, people will sort of get used to this little bit of, um, you know, coffee sipping time or let your mind wander time in between calls. Uh, Sean, I think we've got a question. Yes. Uh, Jeff asks, uh, our average after call work time is too high. Can you suggest a quick way that we can bring it down? Mm. Okay. John. Ah, well, the quickest way is to uh, is to implement um, uh, some some uh, individual or group uh, training and coaching. That is to say, uh, combine that with call monitoring. Determine uh, what it is that's causing the the call after call work time to uh, to be long, and uh, then uh, and then. Combining that with uh, training programs uh, that can be done either on an individual coaching basis, on a group uh, tr coaching or training session, and uh, and give them uh, tools uh, or, or or not tools, but uh, but suggestions on on things that they can do to to uh, speed up their after call work time. Mm. Uh, often the uh, uh, centers ha have groups where some individuals seem to excel in uh, in being able to do after call work efficiently and quickly. Uh, those are the people that the coaches and supervisors ought to select to work with others who seem to be having uh, a problem. Uh, pass along what they all have already learned. Uh, sometimes seasoned agents have picked up techniques and. Uh, and uh, ways of improving their their call uh, after call work time, and those can quickly be passed on to mm -hmm. the, the newer agents uh, as uh, skills and techniques that they can follow. Yeah, n never underestimate really uh, communication and training and coaching and how that can all help out. I've been in many situations where managers feel like, okay, what am I going to do about this? I need the agents to do something, and uh, how am I going to get them to do it? And you know, oftentimes they just forget. You just sometimes just need to tell them about it. If they're, uh, you know, reasonably mature uh, and dedicated people, if you say, look, we need to do this in terms of our metrics, we're going to be uh, tracking it, and here are the goals, but also here's the support we can give you in terms of tips, which you mentioned, John, and uh, they come through the coaching, and uh, that will help actually uh, give success on the metric. And if you can also um, indicate, you know, some ways that other people are succeeding, then that's great. Um, you know, one other thing, too, is, and I'd be interested if uh, people in the audience have uh, strong opinions on this, is generational differences. 
one of the things that can drive us nuts about our kids is that they're always multitasking, right? They seem to be talking on the phone, they are uh, watching TV, and they're writing their paper for school at the same time. And that ability to multitask can sometimes uh, actually be positive for call center managers in terms of uh, bring down after call work time because they get to do more during the call. Uh, so that's just something. John, do you have any comment on that, or should we go on to the next question? Uh, well, just a brief comment, and that is that in the responses that we received in our survey, uh, a number of respondents indicated that they're moving towards ways to teach their agents better multitasking skills. So mm. it goes right along with what you were just saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, we'll have to do some research at some point, too, on the Gen X, Gen Y factor and millennial factor just to see if, in fact, that is something good. And there may be some people in the audience who haven't thought about that before and who may, in fact, uh, have some problems with the Gen X, Gen Y millennials and may, in fact, find a little bit of a silver lining in those people if they can motivate them to do well. Um, right. I uh, Bruce, other... I did, I... Go ahead. I, I just wanted to throw in one other thought, and that is that uh, – in addition to the training, coaching, and uh, passing on the skills from uh, agent to agent, there's also uh, in, uh, in the introducing of incentives that can many times encourage people. You know, setting up a contest mm -hmm. uh, with uh, rewards, uh, gifts, plaques, uh, or, or other things. Uh, uh, one of the most popular is uh, uh, offering a, a priority and shift bidding to high performers. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there's in, uh, monetary incentives uh, and promotions, uh, extra time off, uh, uh, and so forth that can be offered as incentives. Mm -hmm. In our survey, uh, over, over three out of every five respondents indicated that they use gifts, plaques, and uh, other, uh, award, uh, other rewards as a recognition for performance in, in, in improving uh, uh, ACW performance. So well, I just wanted to add that part. No, it's, it's great. Absolutely essential. The incentive part is important. And uh, remember when at the beginning of this show we mentioned that any of you who don't know what your, the cost per second of uh, you know, agent time is and therefore of after-call work time should calculate that because if you're trying to get approval through for some of these incentives, whether they be direct monetary incentives or other kinds of incentives that may cost a bit of money, um, and, and you can show that uh, a second of time is worth X, and then you can show that uh, by giving an incentive that's one-half X, you can actually get better performance, then you've got a very strong case for your management to, uh, to fund uh, the incentives that you're looking for. So uh, important things to do on uh, in terms of improving your performance. Okay, Sean, do we have uh, another question? Uh, <clears throat> we do, but uh, let, there, there were two uh, questions that came out uh, more clarifying. Um, Tom just asked, uh, please repeat the industry benchmark uh, for after-call handle time. Uh, did you say 2.5 minutes? Yeah, uh, no, two and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes. Two and uh, a half minutes. Yeah, two and a half minutes. Okay. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. And then another person asked, in answering Jeff's question, you suggest coaching uh, about good techniques, but you're avoiding saying what those techniques actually could be. Do mm -hmm. you have any techniques that you could suggest? Sure do. John, do you want to handle that first? Uh, absolutely. Uh, coaching on techniques uh, actually starts at the very beginning of the hire process. People should be, uh, 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 prospective agents should be screened for their typing skills and also not only typing skills but their accuracy skills. Uh, if that's made a part of the initial screening and training process, then that will carry over into the uh, call center as, uh, as, they, as they go live and, and begin to perform. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the next thing on, the, on training is training uh, uh, the agents clearly on what's required in te call text, logs, notes, etc. Uh, many times uh, call centers assume that uh, an agent is just simply going to write a, a verbal dialogue of the call, uh, and the, you know some people can turn turn that into an essay. Uh, but it really uh, 
uh, needs to be passed on and and uh, Im- and uh, embedded in the minds of the agents that there are certain specific uh, uh, pieces of information that need to be documented, and once those are done, uh, that's sufficient for the call record. Mm-hmm. So, so those are are two things uh, really quick, and then a third thing is to uh, to check uh, the uh, the various uh, time classifications that you use in your switch to make sure that uh, that activities that are not related to after call work are not getting rolled into the after call work metric in your switch. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's not as obvious as the others, but sometimes uh, uh, you know ACW or uh, aux time or other uh, work codes uh, are are um, are not used, and the agents end up using ACW time for for uh, uh, bathroom breaks, uh, things of that kind. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. actually, interesting you mentioned bathroom breaks because I was in a center recently where they had uh, posted in the bathrooms the uh, uh, things about record keeping for the after call work time, and um, in terms of specific things, I think the name was Tom for coaching. Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, the tips that people who have been there a while know. And uh, since after call work time is very much dependent on the uh, CRM system, uh, it's very hard to generalize. But some of the things that I've seen work in specific situations, Tom, are uh, understanding where you can uh, cut down on time by cutting and pasting information. Uh, obviously, that's where the coaching comes in. What you tell the IT people is you should make it so that you can populate uh, with a, a click of a button or automatic population. But, uh, you know, you were talking, Tom, you are particularly asking about uh, coaching uh, rather than the technology. And therefore, if people know where they can perhaps cut and paste instead of having to re-enter, uh, the most optimal way to go around the CRM page uh, I've seen people say, oh, yeah, you know, some of the new people are doing things this way, whereas if they did it this way, they'd be able to do it a lot faster. Uh, toggling is uh, one of those things as well. So if you put those things together, what your uh, best practices agents are doing in terms of efficiency in inputting the information, guiding the call, because sometimes uh, if you can guide the call, you can teach people how to guide the call for getting the information that's needed for the customer record, then uh, you can avoid having the call guided too much by the customer and therefore having to you know, jump all over the place. Long term, you should try to get your technology right. Short term, by using uh, best practices, uh, tips, and tricks from your best agents uh, and pushing those over through t- uh, coaching, you can really gain a lot of time. Okay, good. Sorry, Sean. Uh, Hopefully that answers uh, Tom's question. I think we did. Uh, So the next two questions uh, are are kind of interrelated. Um, Michael asks, Benchmark Portal is the authority on call center performance. So what is the average after call work time across the general industry? And Christine, uh, which kind of goes over uh, the similar metric, uh, asks, we implemented a new comp system last month. Uh, after call work time has almost doubled. Is there an average time in which I can expect after call work time to even out? Mm, interesting. Okay, I'd love to know the details on that second one. Well, two and a half minutes is the uh, all industries average for um, after call work time. However, it will vary considerably from industry to industry. So the best way to know what it is for your industry is to be- do a benchmark and, um, and see how your uh, after-call work time compares directly with the, the industry average for yourself. And if you want to send us an email, we can, we can find that out for you. Um, in terms of that second one, John, do you want to comment on, on that? I think there's a ton of variables that we don't know about, but uh, uh, her after-call work time doubled as a result of a new comp system. Goodness. Yeah. Uh, well, that that's certainly uh, surprising for me to uh, to hear, but uh, but but not un, not unheard of. Uh, oftentimes, when new technology gets implemented, um, 
there's a learning curve period. Uh, I suspect that the reason that the time doubled is be- because uh, there there wasn't enough forethought to the uh, to the the uh, training of of uh, agents, uh, and uh, they're getting acquainted with the uh, the new techniques uh, that the automated uh, or the technology system uh, introduced, mm-hmm. and. Uh, so I I believe that it goes back again to to monitoring and coaching. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe they need to take a look deep look at uh, what what has happened uh, and what is the reason for this, mm-hmm. and determine whether it has to do with the technique, whether it has to do with a, a whole different uh, way of logging the call in terms of uh, fields that need to be uh, uh, filled or. Um, that information that needs to be supplied, but uh, but definitely, uh, I think over time, if they're if they're aware that this is a problem and begin to delve into what are the root causes and then implement training and coaching right. to uh, to deal with it, that they can bring that back down. Okay, good. but that number is a very high number. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, people processing technologies. Uh, we got to. Okay, Sean, you have another caller. Maybe we can still fit in, even though we're sort of at the bottom of the hour. But uh, love to take another one. Uh, yep. Just give me one second. I just need to bring her on. <clears throat> uh, Manisha, you are live. Please ask Bruce and John your question. Okay, I wanted to know if you factor in call delay in your AC. In, do industries factor that in in their ACW? Uh, well, the, a really good question, and uh, the way that most switches are uh, uh, ACDs are designed, that is not included. Delay time is not included in uh, ACW time. Mm-hmm. Um, if if you think that in your particular situation it is, then that's, that's an area that you ought to get in touch with your IT people and have removed uh, because that's really not something uh, that's under the agent's control. And uh, Manusha, what, what sort of a system do you have? Um, we have Nortel. Nortel? Um, uh-huh. 100%. Yeah, okay, and, and do you know whether that is uh, currently included in your after-call work time or, or you're not sure? No, it's not included. That's why I wanted to know if um, we have our wrap time is one minute. Our after work call time is one minute. Mm-hmm. However, I believe there's a 35 second call delay, and um, I believe the agents are probably using that time to finish mm-hmm. documenting calls. So I want to know if that should be a part of the ACW, or should we um, just separate that mm. from the ACW? Well, we get into a gray area here, absolutely. Uh, John, did you want to comment on that? Well, um, uh, I, can, I can see both sides of that question. Uh, in my mind, um, and again, uh, what I think is, is fair to the agent is uh, they can't be judged or penalized uh, for a built-in uh, delay, and so I have to call what, to measure them accurately in order to uh, to determine how they're performing, uh, that should not be included in the ACW metric. So just to be clear, we have a situation in which uh, agents uh, finish the call and then they go into after-call work time and uh, they do the work that they need to do and then they push a button and they're back or you know however it's done uh, with the desktop. And at that point, uh, they're available again, but there's a scheduled delay in there which allows them for a little bit of a pause before they're actually going to be uh, taken up again in queue. Um, and, you know, what should we do about that? And I think that uh, if, if that's the situation, then, uh, then, then what John Chatterley is saying is right. That is um, obviously time that the management has to be aware of, but it's not really after call work time. It's more like pause time. Uh, John, do I have that right? Do you agree? That is, uh, that is right, Bruce. Right. Okay, Manusha, does that answer your question? And is there are there anything else, anything else on uh, after call work time? No, that answered my question. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, thank you. I'm sorry, but what I was I wanted to know is, did do you find that some agents are using that pause time, or is this like a unique situation where we have the pause time and other industries don't? 
I think that you know that that sort of agent-based type of thing, and and uh, in a sense, from a managerial point of view, uh, you like that because that means that they are actually uh, digging into their own pause time or delay time for uh, doing real work, right? <laughs> so you say, hey, great, uh, but statistically, um, you know, I I I think most. Uh, centers will find that their agents will use after call work time for work time, and then they'll push the button and they will be in in pause. Okay. And just a, just a follow on comment uh, to what you just said, Bruce, and that is um, that if you're benchmarking yourself with with other companies in your industry, um, make sure that you're all using the same uh, definition of after call work time. Uh, so that you're not benchmarking, uh, so that your after-call work time with rep, with the delay time uh, rolled in is not being benchmarked against a company uh, whose uh, after-call work time is is strictly that. Right, and 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 uh, benchmark where we don't in- include that, and that's why we have a very extensive glossary of terms uh, and answer questions on these things all the time, just to uh, make sure that it is apples to apples. Well, thank you very much for your call. Uh, great. Uh, Sean, uh, should we end it off here? I know we've gone beyond our half hour. A lot of uh, interest in this topic. Yep. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank our co-host today, John Charlie, for his uh, great insight in the show. Thanks for all the questions from the participants. Uh, another really great show. Uh, <clears throat> um, don't forget that you can sign up for our reality check to see how uh, you're all after call work time compares to peers in your industry. Our winner uh, today for the in-depth reality check is Christine. Uh, Christine, if you could send an email to calltalk at benchmarkportal.com, we will get you your free in-depth reality check. The topic for our show on February 3rd is compensation strategies for agents and supervisors. Um, again, thank you for attending our show, and we'll see you on February 3rd. <laughs>